Hey there, everybody. This is Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us here on Law and Crime Now. George Floyd, Ahmad Arbery, Lori Vallow, David Dorn, a lot of big topics we're going to cover. But right now, where we want to start is upstate New York, because as you probably heard, the two police officers who were accused of shoving a 75-year-old protester to the ground over the weekend, they have been arrested and charged with second-degree assault. Now, they have been released on their own recognizance. They have entered not guilty pleas. And we're going to get more to the police response to their arrest. Arrest. But I want to start right now from everything that happened with that video. So let's take a look at it. Back up, back up. Get off the steps. Let's go. Get back. Get back. We have an EMT on scene. So the two officers there, Aaron Torgalski, Robert McCabe, they have been arrested. And I want to bring in our guests right now to talk about what are the next steps and what this all means. So joining me today are Law and Crime's own Terry Austin and Julie Rendleman, as well as forensic, forensic death investigator from Jacksonville State University, Joseph Scott Morgan. Great to have everybody on board. Julie, want to start with you. Great to have you. I think first time you have seen you in a long time, at least virtually. And I want to start with this really big case. So the charging decision here, were you surprised that the officers were in fact arrested and charged over the weekend? I wasn't, uh, you know, I hate to say that it, it you know, it, video speaks for itself. Um, there's no question um, that a crime was committed. I think the question at the end of the day is going to be um, whether or not they can make out the intent. Um, there's two charges under assault too. I don't know which one it was, if it was intent to cause serious physical injury or intent to cause physical injury. Um, but you have to be able to make out that intent um, and that may be a part of it that may be a little difficult for the prosecution, but there was a crime. It's a question of what that crime is. So I actually want to show something. This was the reaction from the officers after these, uh, these defendants, these accused, left the courthouse. Now, I should tell you, after they were initially suspended without pay, 57 members of their emergency response team resigned from that unit in protest. This was the response these officers got from their colleagues. This happened just in the last hour. Two police officers were charged with felony assault during a protest in Buffalo, and they were applauded by their colleagues as they left the courthouse. Officers Robert McCabe and Aaron Torgalski pleaded not guilty. They were released without bail. Terry, your thoughts on that response? It's disappointing that that many officers feel as though that those actions were justified. It's clear that pushing an older person, having him fall down, not rendering aid, those are not the types of actions that we should be applauding. So I'm very disappointed, and I am hoping that there is some change in the system. Well, you know, there's a change in the system, and we're going to get to that later on about what that can mean. But, Joseph, what about a change in condition here? Because the last we heard, this man, the 75-year-old, Martin Gugino, serious condition, stable but serious. What can you tell us from that fall, the impact that he sustained? Because he's literally bleeding from the ears. Yeah, that's indicative of some type of uh, potential, potential basilar skull fracture. He struck the occipital area of his skull on this very hard surface, this uh, very firm surface. And you can see his head almost, it, well, it literally does bounce at that particular time. Um, you know, some of the complications with this are going to be, uh, you know, the swelling of the brain, this sort of thing. But from my understanding, he's completely lucid and, and, and talking right now. I think he even sent out a tweet, if I'm not mistaken. So I think that he's probably on the road to recovery, but it's a very dangerous fall that he took. Yeah, I was going to ask you, and, and, and Julie, I don't mean to get morbid here, but they're currently charged with second-degree assault. If, God forbid, his condition worsened, 
Could the charges be elevated? Could they face even uh, a more significant charges uh, down the road? Again, we, we're, we're hoping of a speedy recovery from Martin Gino, but at the same point, what we saw was horrifying. So in New York, um, yes, you could. It's not it, it's not the same type of felony murder that we're seeing in some of the other states. Um, but it, the problem would be, again, is it t we go to intent. Um, could it be raised to some type of manslaughter? I mean, again, God forbid anything should happen with regards to uh, the victim in this case. But if the worst case scenario would happen, we could be talking more of a manslaughter, reckless endangerment situation. I don't think we can make out the intent that would be required for a murder charge. And, and Terry, and, and I don't even want to get into that conversation. Hopefully we never have to. But Terry, let me ask you real quick. Uh, let's say everything stays the way it is. Second degree assault, serious charge. Do you think if they're convicted, what could theoretically happen to them? Because couldn't they defend themselves and say, hey, listen, you know, we were asked to remove a crowd. This guy came in our face. At one hand, it looked like he was reaching towards the belt of an officer. And, and we didn't, you know, we did what we had to do. We didn't know he was going to fall over and hurt himself. So what could theoretically happen to these officers? Well, you know, right now they still have a job, I think, and they could obviously get fired for failure to follow practices and policies. And, you know, they can get prison time here. I think that the other police officers, too, they had a duty to intervene, and no one did anything. They see that this individual is lying on the ground. He's bleeding from his ear. It's a serious injury, and all of them had some yeah. sort of duty. So there could be a problem for the rest of the force as well. Well, we wish the best for Mark Magino and a speedy recovery, and we will continue to follow what happens to these two officers. But we're living in an age where a lot of things are being captured on cell phone footage. Let's go to Maryland now. You probably saw this. This cyclist has just been uh, arrested, and he has been charged for uh, in a video that went absolutely viral of seemingly attacking teenagers who were putting up flyers against police brutality. Now, this man, Anthony Brennan III, uh, he was arrested. He was charged with three counts of second-degree assault. I want to turn to the video because it was this video that helped ultimately lead to his apprehension. You know, it was a situation where the police were receiving hundreds of tips. So let's actually watch this video. Away from me. Hey, leave her alone. Do not touch her. Do not touch her. She has nothing. Do not she touch her, sir. Leave her alone. Sarah, you just walk, walk away. away. Hey. Hey, get off of her. Fuck you. Just get out of here. What? Right. Hey. What the fuck? Give me the fucking thing. You want it? What? Give it to me. That's okay. Take me. So apparently he actually took that bicycle and hit the guy that was in that video or you seemingly in the video and fell down serious charge, serious charges here too, assault charges as well. I mean, what, Julie, were, were you surprised that he was found? Were you surprised that he was charged? Is this the right call? What could he face? First of all, this is the one of the crazier videos I'd seen. He, he, I, I couldn't figure out if there was something mentally not right with this guy because he's not just going after an adult. He's going out after a child, and, and you actually see him trying to fight the child to take the papers from her. Um, I think the most serious charge is when he clearly, intentionally— takes his bike and rams into the person who's filming. And that's where the intent for the assault, I think, is going to come in. Um, you know, he's gone out to, to apologize for his behavior. He's indicating he's trying to get help. I think he clearly needs help um, on, on many levels. Um, but could he be facing jail time? Absolutely. Absolutely. Terry, let's talk about this. He, he uh, issued an apology. I'm sick with remorse for the pain and fear I caused the victims on the trail and online. He uh, says he's been cooperating with police. Um, you know, he surrendered himself, hasn't really been, uh, you know, fighting any of this. He's been accepting responsibility. Will that help him, Terry? Well, you know, it might help with his public relations, but it's not going to really help with the legal case against him. Here's the problem. These individuals were posting flyers, and it was for Black Lives Matter. And the intent behind this assault was really, it seems, 
and we'll see what the evidence says, but it seems as though it was racially motivated. It was a frightening situation. And I think the woman who was trying to intervene was the mom. And if that's the case, I'm just grateful it didn't get to another level because a mother protecting her own daughter, there's no telling what she might have done had the individual not backed away. And real quick, Julie, are we seeing a situation where we might have a plea deal where he doesn't fight this? And what could that look like? Well, you know, again, every state is different, um, you know, and I think that there's going to be mitigation that comes out, um, I, I hope for his sake, um, because, you know, it seems like just, you know, in the wake of everything that's happening, such an inc I, I that shocked me. And I, I hate that I'm shocked because I shouldn't be shocked at anything anymore. Um, but do I think there's going to be a plea deal? Yeah. Do I think at the end of the day, um, I see him going to jail for a long time. No. Are there other ways of dealing with an individual like this? Yes, in terms of if there's a mental health issue, um, if there's community service, if there's something to teach him how to treat human beings, perhaps that might be the best course. Well, we might see this because that was something to watch. I mean, that these videos uh, that are coming online, I mean, it's just capturing all kinds of behavior on all different sides, whether it's police or people who are rioting. It's just absolutely crazy. And I'm sure this won't be the last time that we're talking about these videos, because when we come back, we're going to focus on some other big cases where videos play a crucial role. We're going to talk about George Floyd. We're going to talk about Ahmaud Arbery. We're going to talk about David Dorn, which is a case that I don't know if it's making enough attention in the media, this retired police captain, captain who was gunned down while trying to protect a store from looters. And when we come back, we're going to start with this new movement called Defund the Police, which is in uh, response to the death of George Floyd. Can this work? What does this mean? And Joseph, I can't wait to get your perspective on this as somebody who has worked with the police and has been a part of investigations. What could all of this look like? So let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll have a lot more. And welcome back, everybody. The death of George Floyd has launched movements, demonstrations, protests, calls for change. There's a new initiative that I want to talk about called Defund the Police. And much of what we've seen has been aimed towards police change, but this is something entirely different. Now, by the way, I should just let you know, when we talk about George Floyd, today is actually his public viewing in Houston. So we're going to get more into the George Floyd case, but talking about this Defund the Police, it's very interesting because the Minneapolis City Council has actually enough members right now to vote to actually dismantle the police department. They have a supermajority. Now, the mayor of Minneapolis, Mayor Jacob Fry, does not want this. He has opposed this. Protesters have not been too happy with his response. This actually happened outside of his home over the weekend. Now, on top of this, we've, it's been announced that the mayors of L.A. and New York City have announced plans to actually cut the budgets of the police departments and fund different programs. Joseph, I actually want to start with you on this one. As somebody who has worked with the police as part of investigations, what's your response to the idea of police departments being underfund, defunded or perhaps dismantled? Well, dismantling in and of itself is striking uh you know the old adage you you better uh <clears throat> you better have a way to get across the river if you're going to blow up the bridge because i got to tell you there ain't no turning back after you do that this is chilling absolutely chilling that this would even be conceived of that it would be talked about and now the folks in minneapolis have the votes in order to do this uh, what's what's your plan you know relative to this how are you going to police the streets 
You know, I think about uh, an elderly lady that's locked in her home and she's in a horrible neighborhood and she's calling 911 to try to get some help because someone's breaking into her house. What are you going to do? Show up with a therapist to talk the person down out of the window ledge? I, I, I don't I don't understand the rationale behind this. It's 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 absolutely terrifying for me. And and I don't you know, I know that the police in Minneapolis, I've got friends at the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office. And I know the police in Minneapolis, many of them are very, very fine professional people and have done wonderful work over the years. Um, I don't know. I, I don't see this turning out well. Well, well, let, let's talk about this, Terry, because there's another plan that, you know, maybe a community action program would be the response if there is crimes. But how does that work? And will this actually work? You know, other departments have tried to do something similar, and I think they're saying dismantle, but I think what they really mean is they will take some of the duties and responsibilities and give it to other groups like the fire department, or maybe they will give it to psychologists, but they can't completely dismantle the police department. If they do that, they'll have to do something in its place. They'll have to give it to another department or do something because there are certain responsibilities that the police may have that you really cannot give to anyone else. So I'm hoping that even though the city council has this majority of nine votes or whatever the case may be, I'm hoping that what they really mean when they say dismantle is give out some of the duties to other areas and then maintain a core of duties and then take the rest of that money and train these police officers and do better recruitment. Well, it's an interesting question, and it, uh, you know, you call for change. Is this the change that people want? Is it the change that people need? We're going to follow and see what ultimately happens across the country. But we talk about George Floyd as being the catalyst for all this. Let's talk about the George Floyd case. So, you, you know, the killing of George Floyd, I want to go to Derek Chauvin, who is one of the uh, four officers who've ultimately been charged here. And today was actually his first court appearance. His bail was upped by $250,000. He's now at bail, unconditional bail, at $1.25 million. So that's a lot right there. And the prosecutors, and the judge seemed to agree here, agree with the prosecution's argument that this guy is a flight risk, the severity of charges, it warrants that. You, you know, we talk a lot about what happened here. And let's go back to big developments that happened in this case where Dr. Michael Bodden, who headed up the uh, family's, uh, the Floyd family's independent autopsy, it was his belief that it wasn't just Chauvin, but the other uh, two officers who were involved, and, and Tutal was actually watching the situation, but the other officers who were involved, they were directly causal, causing the death of Mr. Floyd. So let's talk about this. Let's take a listen to what Dr. Bodden had to say. Uh, the autopsy shows that Mr. Floyd had no underlying medical problem that caused or contributed to his death. This is confirmed by information provided to uh, Dr. Wilson and myself uh, from the family. He was in good health. The compressive pressure uh, of the neck and back are not seen at autopsy because the pressure has been re released by the time the body comes to the medical examiner's office. It can only be seen uh, serious compressive pressure on the neck and, and uh, back can only be seen while the pressure is being applied or when, as in this instance, it is captured on video. And uh, in this instance, we can see after a little bit less than four minutes, that um, Mr. Floyd is motionless, lifeless, and when the EMS arrive and put him on the stretcher without any CPR at that time, um, during the uh, ambulance trip, the, uh, he did not respond to CPR and did not respond to, to cardiac shock. The cause of death, in my opinion, is asphyxia 
due to compression of the neck, which, as Mr. Crump indicated, can uh, interfere with blood flow and oxygen going to the brain, and compression of the back, which interferes with breathing. When he said, I can't breathe, unfortunately, many police are under the impression if you can talk, that means you're breathing. That is not true. I am talking and talking and talking and not breathing in front of you. So the, the concept that a person says, I can't breathe, like Mr. Garner, like in this instance, uh, means you should take it seriously. Joseph, let's start with you real quick. So there's a difference of opinion here in terms of the independent autopsy and the ME's report in terms of cause of death and the contributing factors here. What did you make of that difference? Well, from my understanding, uh, Dr. Biden had stated at some point in time that he saw a uh, focal area of hemorrhage adjacent to the carotids uh, or the carotid, specifically the right one. And I can't remember precisely which vertebral bodies were involved, but it seems like two through four or three through five. Um, in Hennepin County's medical examiner's uh, report, uh, which is very detailed, by the way, they don't state uh, that they appreciated any kind of hemorrhage in this specific area. Now, Dr. Bodden is right. Yeah. This, it can be compressed, and it can create an anoxic event where you're getting insufficient oxygen flow. Also, the chest is being held down from the rear. That compresses as yeah. well. He's correct. But this guy does have serious underlying heart disease, which they've talked about extensively in his autopsy report. Well, the independent report doesn't seem to believe that that was a major cause. Uh, so it's going to be this back and forth will be interesting. Uh, Julie, real quick, want to get to you on the $1.25 uh, million dollar bail here set. Were you surprised by that decision? I mean, it's interesting because it was increased by another two fifty. dollars and where, where did that come from? So it doesn't surprise me. And a lot of times this will happen after the, there's a grand jury presentation or preliminary hearing. It, it depends. Um, but, you know, sometimes it, as long as the prosecutor can present additional facts and reasons why additional bail is appropriate, in this case, even the upgrading from, you know, murder three to murder two, anything like that can be a basis for a judge to consider um, raising the bail. And I think it was appropriate considering the amount of time he's facing with the murder two. Yep. Well, we're going to see what happens next with all four of the officers. But when we come back, we're going to focus on Ahmad Arbery. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everybody. Ahmad Arbery was gunned down in February. Three men have been arrested and charged. We covered the preliminary hearing last week, and there's a lot to get to there. But less than a month after the death of Arbery, we know that Brianna Taylor, this EMT from Louisville, Kentucky, was killed in her apartment by police during a raid. And now the families of both Taylor and Arbery are sharing grief. I'm going to play you right now uh, a video message that Ahmad Arbery's mother sent to uh, Taylor's mother, uh, a message of support. I want to play that for you, and we're going to talk about it on the other side. Hi, Ms. Taylor. My name is Wanda Cooper Jones. I'm the mother of Ahmad Arbery, the gentleman that was killed over in Brunswick, Georgia. I'm reaching out to you particularly on this day because today was your, day, your baby's birthday. I know days are difficult, but this day in particular is very difficult because Ahmad's birthday was back on May the 8th. There's no words of comfort that I can share to you from mother to mother, but what I can share is to let you know that you have always been in my prayers and also to let you know that if there's anything that you may need and I can assist, please feel free to reach out to me. If it's just a listening ear, someone to talk to who can relate to your pain, I'm here. And lastly, I want to say happy, happy, heavenly birthday to Miss Brianna. 
And Miss Taylor, she was such a beautiful child. Terry, you listen to that, it's really powerful words. Do you think that there's a sense that authorities in Louisville have to charge the officers based upon the maybe pressure? I mean, we see this case of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, it's all happening at once. And, and do you think when we see this, when there's calls to action in other cases, there has to be a call to action to another case, even though the circumstances are quite different? Jesse, let me just start by saying that's the first time I've seen that video. And as a mother, I am definitely moved by that one mother to another mother. But yes, I do think that what is happening in society today in our communities will affect other cases. And I think what is going on with George Floyd, what's going on with Ahmaud Arbery will definitely affect the Breonna Taylor case. And it's taking much longer for the charges to be brought but it was excessive force. And I do think, and I hope at the end of the day that at least charges will be brought. Convictions are difficult to obtain, but I think making the right moves in the right direction will help these mothers heal and it will help the community to heal as well. Yeah, and Julie, let's focus on uh, Ahmad Arbery for a second. We saw this bombshell preliminary hearing last week. What are you looking out for next after we learned all these details and potential defenses from each side? One of the things that stuck out, I'm sure this stuck out in everyone's head, is what William Ryan says that one of uh, the defendants stated right after uh, the young man was shot and killed. Um, he indicated that there was a, a racial slur after he had been shot and was laying on the ground. And I think the thing that stands out to me, besides, you know, that, that we certainly have, you know, the ability at this point, as far as I'm concerned, um, that the evidence exists for a hate crime. But the question begin for me is, is this individual going to be used now as a cooperator? Because the statements he gets from uh, one of the, I, I believe it's from the shooter himself, is potentially hearsay. And if it's hearsay, the only person right. it can potentially come through is Mr. Ryan. And so I'm wondering if he's going to be flipped, um, because this might be the reason that they do. They want that it, piece of evidence in. And that's a common question we've had, is what role he plays and what's going to happen next with him. Joseph, we have not had a chance to really talk about Ahmad Arbery. Your perspective on the crime scene, because I wanted to bring you in earlier to talk about how I think they were canvassing the area with drones and trying to understand exactly what happened there. Your perspective and insight onto the, the, the shooting of Ahmad Arbery. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know that, <laughs> that we need a lot more uh, other than that videotape. It's, it's shocking. I mean, it it really shocked me, and it, you have to go a long way to get to that point with me. Uh, he died uh, as a result of a shotgun blast, and it, it's, uh, you know, I hate to keep using this term, but it, it, this is truly chilling. Uh, out in a sub, uh, suburban street, you know, you can actually see this take place in front of you. And, uh, you know, here we have this, this puff of gunpowder in the air, uh, and it is horrible, absolutely horrible to watch. And it is going to be something that is going to be very, very powerful in the courtroom. I can guarantee you that. Uh, and it's inexcusable. Well, you talk about powerful. Let's go back to the preliminary hearing. I just want to play you one of the uh, or some of the biggest moments that we've seen. I mean, again, when we're talking about bombshells, you hear the words that were attributed to Travis McMichael and possible defenses. Take a look on the crime scene that was overheard by one of the defendants and shared with investigators prior to police arriving, correct? That's correct, yes, sir. And though this may be an uncomfortable conversation for the benefit of the court and for the record, um, we're making it clear that this is not your quote, it's not the GBI's quote, this is a quote from a statement of Mr. Bryan as to what he heard Travis McMichael say prior to police arriving, correct? Very much so, yes, sir. Um, understanding that and understanding that it might be a, a little uncomfortable to talk about the words because it involves a, a curse word and something else, I need to ask you about that quote. Can you please articulate for the court what Mr. Bryan said he heard Travis McMichael say prior to police arriving and after the fatal shooting? Yes, um, Mr. Bryan said that after the shooting took place, before police arrival, while Mr. Aubrey was on the ground, that he heard Travis Michael make the statement, fucking it's, it's your decision then as you move forward through the case that you are of the opinion that this was not self-defense by Mr. 
Michael. I don't believe it was self-defense by Mr. McMichael. I believe it was self-defense by Mr. Aubrey. Okay, that's why he took the warrant the way he took the warrant. Yes, sir. I believe and Mr. Aubrey was in pursuit, and he ran until he couldn't run anymore, and it was turning back to a man with a shotgun or or fight with his bare hands against the man with the shotgun. He chose to fight. And not to run through a side yard or not to run through another yard or anything like that? I think his thing was to, I believe Mr. Aubrey's decision was to just try to get away. And when he felt like he could not escape, he chose to fight. And, but it is clear from the investigation that for the driving and the interactions that took place all around that area, that no shot was fired at any time by anybody prior to the hand-to-hand -hand combat that Mr. Arbery and Mr. McMichael engaged in. That's what the evidence That's so what far the evidence shows. shows so far. Yes. Okay. All right, moving from one big case now to another, David Dorn is a name you probably heard a lot about, or you at least should have heard a lot about. This was this retired police captain from St. Louis who was gunned down. Uh, there's been a public outcry to uh, apprehend the men responsible, and we actually have seen this. This, again, is that 77-year-old man who actually tried to defend his friend's business uh, from looters. And, uh, you know, Stephen Cannon, is, who's the alleged shooter, he has been charged with murder, amongst other crimes, and Jibby Robinson faces burglary, theft, and armed criminal action. Uh, Terry, I want to start with you. How important were these arrests? You know, it was a very fast arrest as far as I'm concerned, and I do think that it was important. And I think part of the reason it's important is because we need to be showing both sides of this racial issue here. It's not just police who are experiencing these brutality situations. But I do think it's also the other side. Now, granted, there's no question that right now police brutality is a huge issue. But if we ever want to solve the problems in our society today, we are going to have to pursue crimes by, you know, people of color against police officers and vice versa. So I think it was important. I don't know where the evidence is going to lead, but I think we have to make sure we have a system that is fair and that is equal applied. Julie, it's our understanding that he was, ex David Doran was exercising law enforcement training. On top of all the surveillance footage and the witness statements, it seems that an idea of these defendants saying that they were defending themselves, uh, you know, in a case where someone was, ha was armed, it doesn't seem that that's going to work for them. Your thoughts? Uh Oh, it's not going to work for them. Uh, um, you know, besides the fact, I, look, I saw the video. It was it was incredibly, incredibly troubling. This this man was seventy seven years old. I you know had been on the force for thirty eight years. I, you know, you can actually see in one of the footage, in part of the footage, one of the defendants with the gun inside of um, the actual pawn shop. And there certainly doesn't seem to be anyone holding a gun to his head, making him hold that gun. Um, so I don't think there's going to be any shot of a self-defense claim. And quite frankly, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to the protesting, when people, when this behavior happens, to me, it impacts those that are trying to change this world, those that are trying to get the reform that we need. And so, it, yeah. you know, to me, it takes away from that. And it's very upsetting. It's an it's an absolute tragedy, and unfortunately, I don't think we've seen enough of this story in the news. But of course, we will bring in more to you when we learn more details. Let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about Letitia Stotch. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everybody. All right, we want to move on to. I guess the word you could say is questionable mothers, mothers who have come under suspicion, mothers who have been charged in connection with harming or allegedly harming their children. Lori Vallow-Daybell, Letitia Stotch. Let's start right now with Lori Vallow-Daybell. As you know, she has been charged in connection with the disappearance of her kids, JJ and Tylee. They've both been missing since September. We don't know where they are. And you know who's not saying anything? Lori Vallow-Daybell. Now, interesting development here because her attorney was supposed to respond to the state on saying if they plan to go forward with a mental health defense. And her attorney has said, we're not answering that at this point. Said it's unconstitutional for me to discuss this at this point. I'll get into the legal framework in a minute, but why mental health? Because those kind of issues are in so important in this case. Let's go back to when Melanie Gibb, who is uh, Lori Vallow-Daybell's best friend, she sat down with, for an interview with East Idaho News, 
and she described what she thinks is going on here. Now, the first part of this I'm going to show you is when Lori seemed to predict that Chad, her current husband, his wife, was going to die. And guess what? She ended up dead. Take a listen to this. And she could end a lot of this if she just would speak and say where the kids are. Yeah. Do you think she will? I don't know. It doesn't look like it. As long as she holds on to these beliefs, she won't. But if she comes to realize which her inner feelings were, could, 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 could Chad really be Satan? And if so, he's a really good one. You know that conversation we had, Lori. Um, maybe that was that telling you, that little feeling telling you inside that, yeah, he wasn't doing the right things and saying the right things. All right, sorry about that. That was about the kids, equally as weird, but this is about Tammy Daybell. Take a look. How did you learn that Tammy had died? Uh, someone texted me, a friend, and not any, you know, person that was associated close, but just a friend. She said, hey, just want to let you know she passed on. And then she, I said, how did you find out? She said, Facebook. What did you think when you saw that she had died? I thought, oh my gosh, she died. That's what they said was going to happen. I wonder what happened. So did you think it was part of the plan? I didn't know how they did it, but I knew it was part of the plan that, that she was supposed to pass away. I mean, other people knew she was supposed to pass away because, you know, Chad knew this information for, you know, quite a, quite a while. My head is spinning from all this. Uh, Julie, I want to start with you. Why would Mark Means, who is her attorney, why would he not disclose at this point if they're going to go forward with a mental health defense? I mean, he had a June 1st deadline and said, nah, I'm good. By the way, I think that you have a new series, Mothers, with a question mark, you know, just like that would be great. Um, but yeah. why? Because he may not know. Um, he may not, either she's not telling him enough to let him decide whether or not mental health is the way to go, um, or he, he's just undecided as to the best approach. Keep in mind, he has no idea right now potentially where the kids are himself. And so it's very difficult for him to figure out the right road. So I don't blame him for wanting to take the time to make the right decision um, before throwing out this defense and deciding later that that's not the defense he wants to use. Julie, that's a great point. We can't assume that her attorney knows the truth and is just not saying it himself. Uh, Terry, a mental health defense in general, would that work here? I mean, what would we be looking at? Because, yeah, we talk about there's religious motivation. Her former husband said that she's lost her mind, and that makes all sense. It's very well and good for this theory. But in a courtroom, in a legal sphere, what could we be looking at here? Well, you know, I think it would help the defense to say that there was some mental illness here, but I don't think they're going to be able in Texas to use this as a defense here. As far as the evidence is concerned, you know, he could be precluded. I, I agree with Julie that maybe he doesn't know exactly what the situation is right now. Maybe his client is not telling him everything. But ultimately, if he is being asked to produce this and he's not producing it, he could theoretically be precluded from introducing it later. So he's walking a very thin line. Uh, Joseph, want to get to you real quick before we turn to Letitia Stock. You got to tell me here, what is your perspective on the, kid, where the kid's whereabouts? We're learning more details from Melanie Gibb. Has your perspective, your theory of the case changed at all? No, it hasn't. I think I think the, the most chilling thing about this, there I go again, is uh, uh, Tylee winding up, winding up in Yellowstone. It's a vast area. Uh, I, I don't know that, that they'll be able to recover her. I've done some digging on my own relative to the terrain, some of the features, particularly uh, the hot springs that are there. Uh, it, it is a vast area and a very, very easy area to get lost in and plus to hide a body. Uh, I don't I don't have the same hope that everybody does. Uh, I'm I'm a cynic. I, I don't think these children are alive. So uh, I hate to say well, that, but it's to, to, to use a word that you have used so many times. It's chilling. That's all that I can say. It's absolutely chilling. Now, Joseph, I want to stay with you because I'm so happy to have you on the program, especially for the whole show. Let's go to Letitia Stotch. Now, I know this is a case you've been following carefully. She is the stepmother who was accused of killing her 11-year-old stepson, Gannon. 
And what happened? She was just hit with a new charge. I want to make sure I get it right. Solicitation to commit escape because she is accused of planning her escape from jail. That's right. Apparently, she was sending notes to other inmates about how she was going to do this, take a broomstick, try to break her window. Yeah. Joseph, as somebody who has been following this case, your thoughts on her mindset? Does this surprise you at all? What, what are your thoughts? No, I, I remember hearing hearing conversations, these press conferences or whatever it was, these comments she was making. And she was saying, well, people will see, people will see, you know, I, I had the best interest of, of Gannon at heart and I cared about him and people are going to have to apologize to me and all these things. She thinks very, very highly of herself. And she, I think that she's very cunning, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, there has been considerable amount of thought that has gone into every action she has taken. And of course, these haven't been uh, the best ideas that she's put forward, uh, you know, uh, we found, or they found. Well, J Gannon's Joseph, just to, just to interrupt you, I, I wanted to ask you: Can you just summarize for our audience, really quick, what is the theory of what happened to Gannon Stodge? Well, he was down for some time. Uh, you know, he was actually found in a suitcase, Jesse, that had been tossed off of US 90 down near Pace, Florida, which kind of runs parallel to the Interstate Highway. My think, my thought is, she was trying to get him into one of the estuaries that would carry his body out into the Gulf of Mexico. He has been brutalized, absolutely brutalized. Uh, They're saying, and we don't know everything yet, but there's blunt force trauma involved, a gunshot wound that's involved. Plus, he's stuffed into this little suitcase and tossed over the edge. It's absolutely horrible uh, what this child went through. And I was really, really kind of thinking about these injuries, Jesse, and I've put a lot of thought into this. I, I'm really interested to know, once everything is open, was this child tortured over a period of time? Because mm -hmm. I think that she I hope, is... I mean, yeah, I, I, I hope not. And, and that's just, uh, it's even horrible to think about. Uh, but, you know, Julie, I, I was listening, I was reading this story, solicitation to commit escape. I haven't heard that one before. What really is this? What is she facing here? Because this is a new one. It, it is new, and I'm laughing just about what Joseph Scott Morgan said about you know you know the idea of mental illness because the the truth is is that she does think things out, um, but she's just really not good at what right. she does, um, and so you know therefore you know this planned escape seemed like an absolutely ridiculous thing, which does raise the issue of whether or not mental illness does exist, because who the heck would have written a letter and then there's letters found in someone's, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But is she facing additional jail time on top of the potential murder? Absolutely. It, it, Terry, you got inmates who are ready to talk like a canary about what she's been doing. What do you think's going on there? These are trying to just maybe get some leniency on their own sentences, testify against her, or really is that not what's happening here? Because. You got people who say she was trying to plan her escape from jail. Well, you know, here's the thing. She's not going to get out on good behavior, that's for sure. And you would think that these defendants know they're in jail. Talking to other inmates is never a good idea, particularly if you are laying out an escape plan. There's no question that these inmates will turn on each other. We see it happening all the time. They get a lower sentence if, in fact, they do, if they can actually help towards the prosecution of the crime. So, you know, it wasn't a smart move, and it didn't work, and you would think that she would have known better. Look, when they looked at her cell, they found a letter, like, Almost as if she said, if you watch me on the news and that I escaped, you know, don't be shocked. Clearly, it didn't work so well for her. And this is a case, in all seriousness, we will continue to follow. As Joseph said, it is chilling, just like Lori Vallow Daybell. Joseph Scott Morgan, Julie Rendleman, Terry Austin, it's great to have everyone on here. Thank you so much. Everyone out there, please be safe. We will be back on Wednesday. See you then.